In this video, we're going to be replacing the shock absorbers on a Smart 4.4. Now, I know no one really has a Smart 4.4, but that's not what's important. The principles in this video will allow you to change these on pretty much any vehicle, you make a model that have shock absorbers. We'll also talk about the differences between shocks and struts with a brief mentioning of coilovers and what those differences are, and how you can replace these with basic hand tools at home on your driveway and save lots of money. So let's get started and get replacing these. So let's just talk about what a shock is real quick. What is a shock absorber? And is it the same thing as a strut? And what is a coilover? I've heard that as well. So this is a shock absorber, and generally this is what they look like across multiple vehicles, trucks and whatnot, you know, with a few minor differences. But the thing between shocks and struts, the main difference is, is uh, you know, how it's tied into the suspension and other components as well. Now, shock absorber, they pretty much dampen energy. So in a case of a vehicle, for example, once the road energy hits the vehicle through the tires, a shock needs to keep the tires planted on the ground as much as possible. So to summarize, you could say a shock or soft shock absorber is any device that dampens energy. So pretty much absorbing shock, that's exactly what they're designed to do. But hey, what about a strut? How, how does that differ? Now struts, they actually support the weight of the vehicle. This is key here. Usually with a strut, it might have a coil spring over the top of it as well, which also helps with vehicle support. But not always, the spring might be separate. But the key difference is how they're sort of integrated in the vehicle. Struts are an integral part of the vehicle suspension, and without struts and any matching coil springs that come with the struts, whether it's a McPherson strut, whether it's built into it or they're separate for you know whatever reason, you cannot really drive the car. It's uh, you know it would be quite an impressive feat to see the car move a mile without struts. They're an integral part of the suspension. So because the struts aren't present, they're not tied into the suspension, there's nothing to hold the weight of the vehicle. The wheels will be pretty much rubbing against the body of the car. Whereas a shock, for example, if the shock absorber right here was absent from the vehicle, the car can still be driven somewhat, especially in an emergency. It's not recommended, but it is possible. And that's because this isn't integrated into the suspension like a strut is. And really briefly, coilovers. Now, um, a coilover is slightly different. It's used for really race and uh, city applications. So if you have a car you take to the track, or you know you might want to ride it around in the city as well, you can actually adjust the alignment specs of the vehicle, like the caster and camber, really easy on uh, coilovers. And you can also adjust the ride height of the vehicle as well with the coilovers. So it's quite easy to do and it's usually for performance application. So before you hit the track you might want to lower the vehicle and adjust some things. And when you're off the track for an hour or two you want to you know, drive it around in the city, you can you know, raise the height of the vehicle. So coilovers are kind of like struts <laughs> in a way, um, but they provide easy adjustments of ride height and alignment specs. That's all they do, it's a performance up, uh, part. For your vehicle. So now we know the difference between shocks and struts and how they differ. Vehicles, you know, it depends on the year, make, and model of the vehicle. You might have two struts, two shocks. Really, the configuration is up to the manufacturer. The car we're replacing on today it has front struts, so that's McPherson struts with the spring on them, and rear shocks. And this is what we're replacing today the rear shocks right here. So one last thing before we get to talking about signs of bad shocks is why these are called gas shocks. Uh, what, what is this? How does it work? Well, inside here, it's kind of like when you lift the boot or trunk of a car, you know, you see these smaller versions at that. And they're called gas springs or hydraulic lifts or something. And it supports the kind of trunk of your car when you open it up. Very similar technology here in shock absorbers. It uses nitrogen gas inside here. And the thing is that when you compress nitrogen, it doesn't react adversely like any other gases. And that's why they choose nitrogen for this purpose. And it's not just nitrogen gas in here, there's also a hydraulic fluid and they're all sealed internally, it's a closed system. So if you ever see some hydraulic fluid, it kind of looks like oil leak out of here, then you know your shock absorber may be on its way out because its case has been compromised, this should be totally sealed. 
So now you know how this works, it's quite easy to figure how this functions as part of the car. This is attached to the body of the car at the top here. This is attached down by the wheels. So when you go over a pothole or a bump, this fights to decompress because of the gas and the hydraulic fluid inside allowing that. So if you imagine with worn shocks, for example, you're going over a bump, it doesn't have that compression because you might have a compromise or something like that. So it doesn't fight to decompress. So your car will kind of go like this when you go over a bump or something like that. And this is how these work. And the number one reason why we need to replace these is the safety aspect because you have two of these one might be worn than the other so when you're on say the freeway or something like that you might have kind of erratic handling of the vehicle because one might be trying to decompress the other ones failed and you know these don't wear evenly either so it's very important for this reason for safety aspect and to also replace these in pairs never replace one of them it's not very safe, and if one's gone, the other's not far behind either. So before you even think about purchasing any shock absorbers or doing this job, let's talk about some of the signs and symptoms of failing shock absorbers on your vehicle. Similar things also apply with struts as well. They have a similar behavior, not completely, but a little bit when going out as well. So let's talk through some of them now. So the number one symptom of a worn shock absorber is the car is overly bouncy. When you're traveling along, the car kind of bounces, you know, by itself. You might hit a hole or a pothole or something like that, and the car bounces way too much and for too long. Normally when you hit a pothole or go over a bump, your car will do the initial bounce, but it seems to keep going like it's overly bouncy. So what we can do is a bounce test, and that's why we just manually push down on the front or rear of the car, because this test actually works with struts too, as well as shocks. Manually push down, the car should return to where it was almost instantly. It shouldn't keep bouncing like this. So the bounce test, it's a lot more obvious when you're driving to sort of detect this. When you do a manual bounce test, it's more noticeable on partially worn shocks. If they're fully bottomed out or something like that, it's hard to kind of generate the bounce and keep the bounce going. But it is something you can try. Another one is uneven tire wear. You might have sort of tread differences, more wear on the outside or something like that. That's an indication that your shocks might be wearing. It's also a symptom of many other things to do with the suspension, but it is a contributing factor that can, can, can be caused by worn shock absorbers too. So it's usually around the outside edge and also on the inside of the tires as well. The third symptom is a physical check. Go under the car and see if the shock absorbers are visibly leaking any of the hydraulic oil inside. It's quite easy to spot and it's a very easy sign the shock is on its way out or it's completely gone. Another sign or symptom is the car is bottoming out or the clearance is quite low. You can see on the front here there's only a slight clearance of maybe just over an inch but on the rear on the rear here, you can see the clearance is a lot higher. That's a good indication. One side of the car is a lot lower than it should be. And that's a really good sign that your struts or shocks are completely worn and sitting down. So you can see one end of the vehicle was a lot lower, around just over an inch. And the other end of the vehicle was maybe two, three inches or something like that. The car's never been modified in any way to be lowered. So it's a very good assumption that the shocks or struts, depending on which end of the car, are completely bottomed out in this case. Okay, so the last one I'm going to leave you with is generic handling. When you're actually driving the car, perhaps going over bumps, freeway driving, things like that. When you're on the freeway, you might find your car might be a little erratic. You're holding the st a steering wheel really steady and your car seems to maybe have a mind of its own or something like that. Maybe if you get a strong gust of wind, your car might sort of, you know, in have increased body roll. You might so find yourself kind of veering a bit, like you're a bit top heavy or something like that. 
And another one, maybe when going over bumps or road inconsistencies, you can't make a kind of wonder or swerve and you're not really sure why. You don't really have much control over this. This is a similar sort of thing. And you may also have poor traction with longer stopping distances as well when you apply the brakes on the vehicle. So now we've talked about some of the signs and symptoms of a bad shock, let's take a look at actually installing this on the vehicle. So when these are shipped to you, they come in a box just like this. They may be tied down, but that's really only to save room in shipping because the box will be smaller. Otherwise, they'll need a long box for this one. So don't worry about this here. You can just take it off and it will slowly extend. And don't worry about any plastic caps either. We won't need those. It may or may not come with a nut. If it doesn't, we'll reuse the old one. If it does, we'll use this one. So now our replacement struts have been unpackaged and everything. Let's get these on the car. So before we jack the vehicle up, we're gonna crack the lug nuts. That just means loosen them slightly, so we're not putting a lot of pressure on when it's on jack stands and it can be unsafe. So I've jacked the wheel vehicle up now. I've placed them on jack stands, so the rear wheels are both in the air now. Now we're gonna pop the wheels off. Now the lug nuts have been cracked while they're on the ground, and we're gonna take both wheels off. When jacking the vehicle up and putting it on jack stands, I've left it in gear and I've also chopped off the front wheels so it doesn't roll away while we tr try to, you know, get it up on jack stands, just so we're doubly safe. Okay, so the wheel's off, we're just going to roll it out the way, and now we have this. So now the wheel's been removed, let's take a look at the shock here. We can see this is the old one, and it actually has hydraulic oil all down here, and it's leaked all the way down. You can see it's caked on through age. And this is something you can actually see without even taking the wheel off. You can just poke your head under and give it a visual inspection. But this is very worn. The sealed container hidden behind this plastic piece has been compromised, and it's leaking this oil. So it's a good job we're replacing this today. So you can see this rear suspension on this vehicle, it uses a coil spring as well as a shock absorber here. So it's just something to note there. So the shock right here, typically they're bolted onto a uh, suspension component, uh, like the lower control arm here. You can see there's just a bolt that goes through here. And this is the lower control arm, ultimately uh, it comes out here, connects to the wheel bearing and ultimately the wheel. And at the top of the shock absorber, you can see it disappears into the body of the car. And remember earlier when we talked about the function of the shock here, we go over a bump or a pothole, the decompression forces the wheel down on the road so it maintains traction and contact with the road. And you can see it does this by connecting to the lower control arm here, which is ultimately connected to the wheel hub and then the wheel. And that's really how it functions. So what we're going to do now is remove the nut off this bolt and remove the bolt completely through the bottom of the shock. And if yours is as rusty as mine, a bit of penetrating fluid won't go amiss. Put it on maybe even up to an hour before to give it the best possible chance. So we're going to release the bottom of the shock first. It's just an 18 millimeter nut that goes all the way through. The bolt on this application is welded on, so I only need to crank this 18. And uh, yeah, we're just going to pop it off. So a little tip before taking the bolt out. If you don't have a nice rust line like mine, and you're not sure of the torque spec, then you can use a marker pen or count the thread, so you're putting it back, you know, as it once was. If you have a torque spec and a torque wrench, you don't need to bother with this stuff. So the bolt's been removed. I'm just supporting the lower control on there with a small little jack here. That's so it doesn't sag too much and maybe the coil spring uh, insulator doesn't get displaced. It's just supporting the rest of it there. So we can just pop out our shock from the bottom socket. If it won't pop out now, don't worry. We're gonna unbolt the top first and then we're gonna take it out altogether. So now we want to free the top of the shock absorber. So on this particular vehicle, we gain access through the trunk or the boot. Here there's a little panel, there's one on each side, so the other side will be the same. We're going to take a small flat head and just pry right here. That will loosen the first bit. Sometimes you get lucky, the second bit will come out with it. So we're going to do the same for the second one. And again that one, and then we're going to get the second piece, and that's out. Now behind this panel here, we can just lift it forward. 
we can see the top of the shock absorber right here. We just need to undo this nut right there. So getting this nut off here, it's 16 millimeters, but the problem is when you try and take the nut off, the whole shaft rotates with it. That's because this whole shaft here can rotate freely inside here. So we need something to keep this steady while we take the nut off and also put it on again. So four methods of doing that. If you have an impact gun, it just needs a quick jolt and you can kind of free it up that way. You can undo it with a wrench. If you don't have an impact gun, if you don't have an impact, especially with a deep socket like that, then you might need a special tool. However, they're all in different shapes and sizes. You see this one here is a slight rectangle. Your next one you might have to undo might be a square or something else. So it does get quite expensive with the special tools. Another recommendation, get your 16 inch open wrench like here, slip it over the bolt, then use some mole grips to keep the rod steady. So it will look something like this. A little penetrating fluid might be a good idea as well. And my last recommendation is to get something like a torque socket. The hex ones seem to work okay, but you don't get enough purchase. But this E11 looks really good. So we're going to knock this on the end here, just like that. And then we can use a standard socket to hold it steady. So it will look something just like that. So now the nut's been removed, we're just going to get a hammer and just pop that straight through the mounting hardware. Try not to damage these, especially if your new shocks don't come with this stuff. We'll need to transplant them. Now we've taken off the mountain hardware here, we can just free this from the vehicle. So it's nice and free up here. It's free down here. We can pretty much just grab it like so and just kind of manhandle it a bit. And it should pop straight out. So it, now it's out the vehicle, we can see a few other things we need to transplant as well, which is this kind of insulator here, some mountain hardware, and also this kind of dust and debris guard. So everything's off the old one now. It's just a case of either pulling it off like the insulator here, or tapping the top with a hammer to get the sleeve off and any optional dust covers and any other hardware. Again, all shocks are different, so it may look slightly different, but the principles are the same. So the new shocks for this vehicle are, are the same. It's the same part number. There's no left and right with these. It's not like the struts on the front. So these are identical. What we're going to do is roughly compare the old against the new part to make sure they're sort of similar, you know, of the same length and whatnot, before we start putting the mounting hardware on the new one. Your application may be different, but this sleeve here has internal threading, so I twisted it off. And when we twist it back on to prevent this from moving with it, we use the mole grip pliers to keep the middle steady. Now everything's been transplanted onto the new part, we can put it back on the vehicle. So let's see how bad the old shock was. Here's the new one. Watch it decompress. See, it decompresses by itself quite nicely and quite smoothly. Let's look at the old one. And here's the old one we just took off. You see how slow that is? So it's not very responsive. It's not totally failed, but you can clearly see it's been compromised and it's on its way out. Also listen to the old one. So installation is the reverse of uh, disassembly pretty much. We're just going to feed this up and put a bolt on. So a couple of tips when reinstalling. Use a floor jack to support the lower control arm and that can also support the uh, shock as well to help guide it in so it doesn't keep decompressing on you. When you get it level here, I've just inserted a screwdriver while I bolt in the top of the shock right there. And then we can replace it with the bolt later. Use the floor jack to jack up the shock so it's as high as it will go. Then we can actually put the insulator on and the mounting hardware without worrying it's going to dip down on us. 
So I'm just putting the insulators on, the mount hardware back on where it was and the bolt. If you forgot the orientation, just take a look at the other one, you have two of them. That's why doing one at a time is a good idea. Next we're going to tighten down the nut. We're not going to do it to spec, we're just going to do it enough so it holds. If your shock came with a new nut, I highly recommend you use that one. One thing I always recommend using is this removable Loctite. It's the blue one, not the red one, the blue one. And that just means if there's vibrations, the nuts or bolts won't accidentally come undone. So I do recommend using these on this job, and that's the nut and also the bolt at the bottom. It's really good stuff. All the parts and everything I'll link in the description below so you can check them out. So the nut here, it's not to spec, but it is tight. Now we're going to do the bottom one, and we're going to finish this one off afterwards at the end. So the bottom bolt, it's just a case of manipulating the jack here so you can get a nice clean entryway. It's a little fiddly, but you'll get there in the end. So I'm going to put a little Loctite on the threads. I only need it there because, you know, that's where it actually screws in on that nut there. There's no sense uh, really putting it all the way through there. Now the bottom bolt's torqued down and it's in its actual sitting position. Then we're going to finish torquing up the top nut through the body of the car here. The reason we do it in that order is because the top one keeps it sitting at the top so we can do the bottom one. Then when the bottom one's torqued down we can finish up the top. That way if you try and tighten it and it's not in its current sitting position you might run the risk of either damaging something, tightening it down when it's not sitting right or anything like that. And once this nut's all torqued down, we can put everything back where it came from. The torque specs for this specific vehicle I'll link in the description below. But for your specific application, check the service manual, they're all different. So that is it, there's our shiny new shock absorber right there, look. That wasn't too bad, was it? And now for the other side, repeat the same process all over again. It's pretty much exactly the same. I just want to say a real quick message to our viewers. You! I made this channel a few years ago and its primary aim was to give you the skills, but more importantly the confidence in order to tackle pretty much any DIY job you may have. In the process we've saved our viewers thousands of dollars or pounds or euros, whichever currency you want to use. I've put multiple hours of time into making videos each and every week, which I somehow juggle between family and a full-time job. If any of our videos on our channel helped you, please support our channel by clicking the thanks button underneath any video on this channel. You can choose how much you wish to donate, it's going to go right back into the channel towards videos, tools and everything else, so thank you very much for that. When you make a donation towards the channel, you can put an optional message and your message will be highlighted along all the comments for everybody to see. The bigger the donation, the bigger the highlight, so everybody can see how awesome you are. So that's how to replace a bad set of shock absorbers on pretty much any vehicle out there. So I hope this helped you. Like and subscribe and thank you for watching.